this could be the time we're actually looking at here because we know about the story of the Nephilim, the the so-called uh, Watchers, or you know from the Book of Enoch or the Anunnaki from the Sumerian tradition, you know, bred with human women and gave birth to these robust, really arrogant giants called the Nephilim. And they understood how to build things, carve things irrigate the land grow food make weapons work with metal all the traditions talk about this and then maybe we're finding all these elements at these sites finding giant bones at these sites isn't happening just yet but considering how little has been uncovered who knows what's going to be found The history of our Earth is so different from what we can imagine. Enjoy the journey. Enjoy the Smithsonian, that if they found out about a large skeleton somewhere, was to go get it. I'm going to assume at least one person is right, because if one person's right, it busts the paradigm. It all goes back to the fallen chair. And the problem with the modern day church, they have a very truncated view of the supernatural. This backdrop is just pregnant with all kinds of meaning associated with this Mount Hermon event. And this guy defects from the kingdom. That's a big deal. So welcome back to Blurry Creatures, Hugh Newman. Hugh, you're a traveler, author, researcher, explorer, and we brought you onto the podcast today to talk about Karahan Tepe, which is you know one of the most important archaeological discoveries. I mean, maybe the century, but at least the last 20 years or so. 11,000 years old site sits in the uh, Tek Tek Mountains in Turkey. Uh, it's one of the tw- one of 12 sites they've discovered there. And you said it's going to be on ancient aliens coming up here soon. But welcome back to Blurry Creatures. We talk about cr- creatures on this show, whether it's giants, Bigfoot, or whatever it is. And I was watching some of the videos on this site, and they have a bunch of weird-looking creatures carved in stone. We could probably talk about some of those things, some chimerical creatures maybe, that maybe have roamed the world back then. So welcome back, Hugh. Love to get into it and talk about Karen Tepe. Sure. Yeah. Sounds good. Let's uh, let's crack into it. There's tons yeah. to tell. I tell you that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's some weird stuff like ancient calendars and some sort of clock in the the pits there with all the the carved out you know sh- the shrine there. I was watching the videos. That's really interesting stuff. But yeah, this relates to the creatures more often than not in our on our show because sometimes people wonder like why we talk about you know sort of this ancient history but there's a lot of weird stuff roaming around so we always find ourselves on this show getting into the megaliths and sort of the pre the pre-flood world yeah for sure i mean if you if you go back to the time of karahan tepe and gebekli tepe which is like nearly twelve thousand years we're talking about there were like beasts all over the place oh my god i mean i think you know they were like uh huge you know big cats there was like foxes there's even like interpretations of what looked like dodos or kind of flightless birds um but there's leopards a lot of leopards apparently uh they're depicted at karahan tepe and at gebekli tepe a lot of snakes amongst other things so um yeah i mean it really was i mean the thing about that about these sites is that they depict what was going on back then they really do it quite clearly so they had a lot to deal with you know we know after a while a few hundred years of them building these sites that's when agriculture developed that's how it all began after these sites were built so they were dealing with these animals and then started domesticating them as well so yeah so there's a lot um you know you do get a lot of creatures in that part of the world at this time for sure mm. yeah he he We've talked about Gebekli Tepe on the show and its importance because it's it's an anomaly, right? Or it was at the time before Kaharan Tepe it was this guy, which is older. But we have these these very intricate, advanced city or city centers or the, these structures that show up meaningly or seemingly out of nowhere um, in a time where traditional archaeology and history has said that everybody was just hunter gatherers and they were, you know, people were. People at that time were migrating around, as you said, there was before agriculture, and it just pops up. 
And since we covered Gebekli Tepe, at least in a couple episodes for, on our show, talk about the importance of, of, of this site. We, we've we been trying to get you on for a while. I know we were talking before Christmas and the holidays. Uh, you actually had an article come out on Graham Hancock's website of, where you were out there breaking down some of the stunning discoveries. It's super important because it's this is rewriting history as we know it. And and as Nate talked about, one of the things we get into here is the idea of of hidden or undiscovered or alternate history, as, as it gets called sometimes. And we know Graham gets a ton of flack for this. And, and even Wikipedia says he's a pseudoscientist. But, you know, Graham Hancock had this massive Netflix thing that's really changed changed a lot of people's ideas about what history was like. And this is one of the sites. And, you, and Nate said, this is going on to Ancient Aliens in a couple of days. You get interviewed for it. But I think a lot of our audience isn't even familiar with what this is. So I would love just to, if you could break down kind of what it is, why it's so important. And then when I talked to you in December, you were there. You you were you were like, hey, I'm going to Turkey. We're going to be there for a week. You know, I could do it from all, I could talk to you guys on site. Didn't really work out because the holidays. But would love for you to just drop some knowledge yeah. about what this is, why it's important, what is there, and, and why it's changing everybody's perspective on on history. Yeah, I mean, as you said, Gebekli Tepe was the one site everyone knows about that's been known about since the mid 1990s. Actually, firstly, really reported on in the 1960s. Whereas Karahan Tepe was actually first recorded in 1997, just two years after the first beginning of the excavation of Gebekli Tepe, but it was left alone. It was in this remote place in the Tek Tek Mountains, which is basically about 20 or 30 miles southeast of Gebekli Tepe. And it was uh, Bahatin Selik. He was the archaeologist who started, found a few pieces there, a few statues of serpents and other such things. I went there first in 2014. I was with Andrew Collins. We were running one of our tours out there. And it kind of blew my mind because, you know, firstly, we got to know the family. We had tea and lunch with them every time we went there. Um, and we, all the site is, wasn't excavated. It was fully covered over. It had like little tops of t-pillars t-shaped pillars sticking out the ground a few artifacts has been found there was this big unfinished t-pillar about 18 feet long down the west side of the hill and that was it really and then on a, a hill another hill north of there which is called ketchley tepe which is actually ketchley tepe is actually the original name of carahan tepe carahan tepe is a later mm. a name given by Bahatin selik in um a 1997 a combination of place names from the local area but ketchley is the official ancient name for it we think which is interesting because in kurdish it translates as uh as, as a feminine element to it like daughter maiden queen sister this kind of thing possibly goddess and the turkish version of ketchli or kek the ketch part of ketchli means bald like a bald head and so the stone head is one of the main features found at Karahan Tepe, which looks like it's a bald head. And so mm -hmm. maybe a memory of that, the two different languages recording this. And we think it's also a feminine site as well, like a possibly a goddess site, fertility site. But for those that know nothing about it, it dates back to 11,400 years ago is the earliest date, which is only two or 300 years after Gebekli Tepe. It, and there was in use for about 1,500 years. What has been uncovered so far is in the northern part of the limestone hill. I must remember, this is like a limestone series of mountains. There's not much vegetation in this area. It's like it's like you're just on another planet when you climb to the top and look out from it. It is quite remarkable. And the northern part of that hill that they've excavated now, and they found this 75-foot wide sort of circular elliptical enclosure, which is similar to the ones at Quebecli Tepe with all the T-pillars around the edge, two central pillars in the middle. But most of it is broken and fallen. But the west side of this huge enclosure is carved out of bedrock. You know, so the whole eastern, north and south edge is all standing pillars, like monoliths, you know, mm. which many have fallen now with benches, kind of stone benches in between them. But the western side is like, then blends into the, the bedrock hill and they carved it all out directly out of the bedrock. So that is incredible in, in its own right. Next to that, jo adjoining it, this, this is a structure, um, uh, a, uh, AC, I think it's called AD, uh, AD rather. And then you've got structure AB, which is what we call the pillar shrine. It's directly next door. It's, it's linked to it via this whole stone, which is about 70 centimeters wide. And we'll talk more about that later. And that, that joins this much smaller structure, which is like 20, 30 feet wide, 
with all these, and it's carved out of bedrock going down into the rock with these 10 sort of pillars. Like they look like kind of uh, mushrooms or phalluses. They kind of, they're carved out of the bedrock. They're like four feet tall, five feet tall, some of them. Uh, the western edge you've got this head protruding out with this serpentine neck mm. this open kind of mouth and you've got this other stat freestanding pillar which is like kind of curved pillar like a kind of half and half a porthole stone or it could be a serpent um it's very odd and then next to that you've got another kind of unfinished pit as well which may it looks like it had water in it or something in it but that's aligned to something important as well and then across the site you've got smaller enclosures with tea pillars all over the place it's a huge huge area and only a very small amount is um currently being excavated and one of the things i know that you you were out there for in, in december was that to see if this thing was celestial aligned it is correct, isn't it? It aligns with the like a lot of ancient yeah. structures. We talk about you know anything from Stonehenge to New Grange to the pyramids, the you know and those things. They're all it's, it's crazy that they're all aligned to to solar events or celestial events. Yeah, you were saying that the the you were there on the winter solstice and the sun was shining right through that porthole stone that was on that serpentine yeah. face of that. Creature. Why do you think they put serpents all over these things? It seems like a familiar theme uh, when it comes to these ancient sites. Yeah, the serpent symbolism is very strong at Karahan Tepe. One of the first statues they found had a serpent rising up the front of this kind of anthropomorphic statue. But all over the site, you get that. You get this very long, like 20 foot long one etched into this bench in the unfinished pit. Uh, which is very unusual because one the one end of it blends into the, the torso and head of a kind of fox or canid, uh, which is very strange. But the serpents are everywhere, and there's lots of symbolism, cosmology related to serpents. There's myths that were later recorded in the Sumerian tradition of Enki and Lil Ninhasag, the Anunnaki. They're all related to serpents. And so you find you do find it very strong. You get lots of leopards carved there, foxes, different animals uh, as well. Um, but you mentioned the uh, the winter solstice. That's why we went out there in December. Yes. We went out there to, to catch the winter solstice is obviously it's the shortest day, longest night, and it's where the sun kind of comes to a standstill at that end of the year and it kind of rises and sets in pretty much the same position for a few days and actually starts returning slowly as the sunrise starts moving back to its equinox position to the east on christmas day that's why this that's why we have all this mythology mm. of christ and all this kind of stuff the return of the light Adida. so it spends a few days kind of sense so we go we go there and just observe it during those few days because it's in the same place and we found it basically the sunrise after about 10 minutes after sunrise the light shines through the porthole stone illuminates like the back of the head and slowly moves around the face over uh, what we thought originally it was a 27 minute period when we first discovered it in december 2021 but we went back this year we got in there a bit earlier i found that it's actually about a 45 minute period it? and it starts behind the year then moves around like this the light does over uh, this 45 minute period um so it's clearly aligned and We've checked it all out. We've had Andrew Collins and Rodney Hale, who's an archaeo astronomer and engineer, work this all out on Stellarium using astronomical data going back 11,000 years. And it works just as well then as it did now, because even though we've got a blick with T of the ecliptic and we've got precession of the equinoxes, it's less than a degree from where it should be, uh, where it is now, rather. And so um, it may have even, we've worked that it could even have been a better illumination of the head. Um, back then but it certainly works you know and it's an observable phenomena you can witness it today which is insane mm -hmm. and it's by far the oldest solar alignment anywhere oh. on the planet the only one that comes anywhere near is jericho in israel which is 8300 bc and we know there's been some research on that a few in 2008 where they found a summer solstice sunset alignment uh, through one of the kind of areas of Jericho, which is a, which is a similar kind of culture. It's the same culture, just spreading out in different areas after Karahan Tepe. I must also point out that there's also another alignment, completely separate, a summer solstice sunset alignment at Karahan Tepe, yeah. which Andrew Collins has discovered. Uh, which is aligned to another, the, the unfinished pit, um, and so 
there's all sort of, and, and that's virtually the exact opposite direction of the winter solstice sunrise, but in the other direction. And so you've got all this stuff going on at this extremely early age, and you know it proves that this was a sophisticated society carving things out of solid bedrock. All this advanced abstract symbolism. Mm-hmm. You've got astronomical alignments. They were collect. They were collecting, harvesting rainwater. They developed agriculture there. They had all these settlements. Now they found at least 12 of them called the whole Tastepola region, which means stone hills, stone mounds. And so Karahan Tepe and Gebekli Tepe are just two of many. And there could be many more. We think there's, you know, we, we're pretty, we've got evidence there's up to about 20 or 30 of them. We've been to many of the others as well. We, we've had a look at them whilst they've just started excavating. And it is mind blowing. There's no, you know, it doesn't make sense. This highly advanced civilization wasn't supposed to exist then basically right. this is this is it's a problem for academics and historians you know it, it, when i when i look at some of these old sites it almost looks like i mean because you were talking about ketchley hill and it almost looks like it could have been maybe some sort of pyramid structure and it's it seems to be built up and then some of these places are like carved into the ground i remember we talked to michael tallinger early on in the show uh, he was talking about some of the the carved in to the ground in South Africa. They had these like things that go down into the ground. So, what is the difference here between some of the, the ancient megaliths that are built up and some of the stuffs carved into the ground? It almost reminds me of like a if you had a piece of property, you had like different things on your property. You had like a your pool house in the back, sort of dug dug into the ground, but then you have you know your your main pyramid, your main structure, your main or whatever it is. It, you know, we modern humans do it that way, but it seems like ancients were kind of doing similar things. They had multiple different structures in, in, in an area. And I was just thinking that maybe Ketchley Hill was something they built up and then uh, Carham was something yeah. built down. I don't know. Yeah, it was a bit of both. It was a bit of both on both, actually, because yeah. there's two like, areas there. But the, the, there's now evidence that a huge area stretching out from Carahan Tepe is part of the settlement, part of the site, including Ketchley as well. There's caves up on Ketchley carved out of solid rock. There's square enclosures carved out of bedrock. There's all sorts of things. That's on the northern hill just near Karahan Tepe. Karahan Tepe itself has a combination of these different things. Even in one of the main, the main enclosure, the enclosure AD, it's this huge ellipse or circle, this ellipse, and half of it's, like I said, it's carved out of the bedrock. The T pillars are carved out of bedrock. The benches are carved out of bedrock. They're like megalithic thrones almost. Whereas mm. most of it, then it kind of blends into, then they fl- blends into the kind of freestanding T pillars. Mm. And then you've got the perfectly flattened floor, bedrock carved perfectly horizontal it's like they they had they knew how to do it they were kind of mm. they also there's also evidence in this and other sites of what's called terrazzo which is basically like an ancient concrete that they were working mm. with ancient cement which is outrageous it, it's lime concrete basically made out of lime plaster kind of thing um and they heat it up let it let it cool and dry and it would harden and things like this made from the limestone and uh remarkable you know that that this this technology was there and so you have you have a mixture like you said of carving out the bedrock and the freestanding pillars which which are originally carved out of the bedrock lifted out transported and placed and, and then smoothed off and, and carved with this precision engineered technique which no one knows where that really came from it's so advanced for its time mm-hmm. yeah, i was going to ask what, what do you make what do you make of this right because this is turning everything on its head this is not supposed to be in this time period it's not this is way older than than anyone expected or academics expected because we're not hum, humans aren't supposed to be able to do this yet right we're still running around chasing migrating herds how does this change the historical record in your opinion and then to follow up do you think there's anything there that's older that we may discover even even than this yeah yeah no well you got to remember this was just after the end of the ice age and so this was also the end of the younger dry ass where the the impacts asteroids this that and the other were hitting the earth there was a very cold period and then it suddenly got dry and warm in around 9,800 BC. And this is within 100 or 200 years of this, Gebekli Tepe was being built. But there are sites which are older during the cold period that existed. There's a place called Kortik Tepe. There's a place called Bonkoklu Tala. Mm. There's uh, Greyfilla Hoyuk. 
there's uh Kakmak Tepe and um, three the first three of those and they're really along the Tigris River, whereas most of the sites around Gebekli Tepe and Karahan are nearer to the Euphrates River. Mm. Both of these rivers are mentioned in the Bible. They're both mentioned mm. in the Book of Enoch, the Sumerian texts, as being where the Garden of Eden was as well. So we're, we're talking like seriously super ancient mm. biblical stories coming to life in this area long before the whole new testament stuff and things like that and all these sumerian traditions the anunnaki may have been referencing this this era we're talking about here because they were said to be highly advanced cultures and the angels the watchers the anunnaki different names given to them um but yes yeah, so there were earlier sites there like the ones i mentioned near the tigris and these had structures they had enclosures they didn't have any big t-pillars yet but they were carving i mean we've seen some in a museum in diabakar in turkey which is near this area of these beautiful kind of stones like you can hold in your hand with 3d relief carvings of abstract mm. figures and animals and these were at least a thousand years before gebekli tepe wow. um, and so we know that there there wasn't you can see a development there you know you can see it and they were that they they built settlements and structures not quite as advanced as Quebecly, obviously, and they were still hunter gatherers, and they would still go off from there and mm. do their hunting and gathering kind of thing. Even the earliest phase of Quebecly Tepe and Carahan Tepe, they were still doing that. Mm. They were still doing that. It's only during the first few hundred to a thousand years of these sites being built did the agricultural revolution kick in, mm. um, and they realised they could grow food or they had to grow food. There were shortages. I don't know. No one knows really why right. it all happened. So there are sites that are older and you can go further and further back into Mesolithic, Paleolithic times and find similar 3D relief carvings, even in Paleolithic caves going 30 to 40,000 years in France, Germany and other places in Spain, uh, where you have, you have 3D relief carvings out of solid cave mm. walls you know so there was a development in style but to build gobekli tepe with the artistic abstract art flair that they had is something remarkable it just seems to come out of nowhere the sudden sh the sudden shift in quality and craftsmanship and sh sheer magnitude of structures that they were making mm. um it really makes you think something profound was going on then you know and that must have triggered this mm. do you think do you think that they had uh had advanced tools that we we, we don't know about or because that's that there's a hypothesis in all this right you have you have the megalithic walls in peru the the, the cyclopean architecture you have even the stuff in egypt karnak at giza and you can find things like the unfinished obelisk and and i know there's something similar there in in, in kahar tepe where you have these unfinished stone workings and that's something we've talked with derek olson who's a frequent guest on our show who's megalithic marvels about about some of the the weird things he's able to he, he surmises and finds like drill looks like drill holes and saw marks and things that are, are precision build when you're there you're on site do you, do you see anything like that is the methodology does it also seem to be advanced like in a way that, that maybe shouldn't be there or is that yeah. more something we see in 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 some of the other megalithic places Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. There's advanced is the word. It's, it's outrageous for its time. I mean, just to fight Egypt blows people's minds. And, and yeah. so it should. It's the magnitude of that is outrageous. But we're finding now similar things in this area. I and mean, one of the two or three really fascinating aspects is number one is the artistic style. It's, it's purely abstract, very mm. odd. Mm. Like it's almost like they've taken a, a bag load of mushrooms or something and got had a religious <laughs> experience or something like this because it, it it doesn't make it doesn't make sense. The abstract, beautiful, almost like it's like they've been doing this for hundreds of years to create these kind of statues with these designs, mm -hmm. and then that stayed that stayed the same for two thousand years. Mm -hmm. Didn't change it one bit. They maintained that, right? And then you've got things like the the stone plates that have been found now these are now on display in chandler for museum this is the the main town that's in between all the sites that's a very ancient town it's got, it's got caves there actually one of the tabula sites is in the middle of urfa and chandler 
where they found the Balikligal statue or Earth a Man, which is a humanoid figure that goes back 10,000 years. Oh. And also, so these stone plates, these were found on the benches in between the tea pillars at Karahan Tepe. And we had a good look at them. We couldn't get inside the cabinet to kind of take them out and, and feel and touch them or anything. But these have been polished. Some of these are hard stone, like diorite and granite or and, and, and different types of very firm, very strong basalts. And these are, you know, this big, you know, they're like, you know, two or three feet wide, some of them, some are smaller, some have got cut marks smoothed out somehow in the middle. I mean, how they did, it's almost like they've softened it or something. So they are really interesting, but no one's talking about them apart from me, Andrew Collins and JJ Ainsworth, you know, friends of mine who I've been working with at this site for years and, um, and they're, they're mind blowing and they're, and they, they're out of place artifacts in my opinion. Also there's drill holes in some of the statues that have been found from Karahan Tepe. Now we, we've not been able to get close enough to see if they're like, whether they've been kind of hammered in with some kind of nail or something, we don't know. But, you know, the fact that they're able to smooth off these kind of plates that we saw is is pretty amazing. And we realised that quite a few more of these have been found around the area over the years. And we actually found one. We actually went to this site, uh, which hasn't been excavated yet, and we met the locals there, and they showed us all these artefacts they found at one of these other sites they're, they're going to start excavating. So, and one of them was a corner of one of these plates. Mm. So we were able to touch it, and I got a scan of it, and, and, like, and it was unbelievable. It's like, what tools did they have when they had no metal, apart from raw copper? That's the only evidence there is of metals out there wow. that they could they could actually create these and so it, it's pretty astonishing yeah so we are starting to see anomalous artifacts like this wow and i know like we we know on our show we get into a lot of the the other creatures that were roaming around at those times and the last time we talked about the giants and how they relate to stonehenge and that's where the conversation like goes to a lot of people who have more of an open mind and then continue to kind of follow the evidence were they around in this time? Were there chimerical creatures with them too? Like it's, it seems like there's evidence for all these. It's not just humans roaming, roaming the, the countryside. Well, as I mentioned earlier, certainly anim different types of weird animals, big animals as well. That's for sure. There's, uh, there's a couple of strange statues um, that have been found at Caravan Temple, which may represent what these very odd looking people look like. One of them has got this, it's like a really long elongated face with a huge area coming out of the back of the head with big kind of brow ridges and frown, frown lines and things like this. The very kind of elongated everything really. And I, I, show, I talked to Andrew Collins about this and this looks virtually identical to a recreation of a Denisovan which are these super ancient kind of human hybrids, you know, going back 200,000 years from Siberia. But we know they made their way down into Turkey. We know they made their way down into North America. And there's it's found in the DNA of the giants there that it's now been proven. And so, you know, were, they, were these Denisovan related giants in this area? This is one of the strange questions that we're actually, actually looking at because they, it could be a reality to that. If you look into the Sumerian traditions, if you look into the book of Enoch and the book of giants, although they appear to be talking about a much later era, they might be talking about, a very early era and this could mm. be the time we're actually looking at here because we know about the story of the nephilim the the so-called uh watchers or you know from the book of enoch or the anarchy from the sumerian tradition you know bred with human women and gave birth to these robust really arrogant giants called the nephilim and they that then but they the technologies the kind of different elements of civilization that they understood they understood how to build things carve things irrigate the land grow food make weapons work with metal all the traditions talk about this and then maybe we're finding all these elements at these sites finding giant bones at these sites isn't happening just yet but considering how little has been uncovered who knows what's going to be found Yes, uh, I wanted to ask you about that. You know, we talked about Gebekli Tepe on a previous episode, and it really, it's the in inexplicable explosion of technology, right, that seems to come from nowhere in a time which shouldn't be there. What do you, what's your take on this? Do you, do you think this is what's happening here? I, I know that, you know, we, we talked about Graham at the beginning and, and his Netflix show. It became wildly popular. People are very familiar with that. 
what are your thoughts on on how this you know advanced of of architecture construction um and then to be it to be very seeming to be very ceremonial at least what, what they say right because people didn't live at these sites they lived n- near to them but not at them these weren't you know there weren't houses and floors and trash cans and stuff like that right what what's your take on on this uh, on these because we're digging stuff up right these were all, the other thing i want to ask you after this is thoughts on why they filled these in and covered these back up um at some point because it seems very deliberate uh, from at least what i've read but uh, it's a two part question i'm sorry yeah no, that's cool. No, no, let's get start with the first one. So that there's like this, I believe, you know, when you go and look at these sites, when you kind of, there's a reconstruction of Enclosure D uh, at Quebec Tepe inside the museum. So you can actually go inside it and get a sense of the scale of it. This is not a domestic site. This Enclosure D is clearly a massive like temple of some sort. It's a, it's a ceremonial space. It's possibly a performance space. It's where speeches may have been given. This is a major thing. This is, and then you get people who claim, "Oh, it's all domestic. Don't worry, it's not a temple." It's all the new archaeologists are saying. And to me, it just doesn't doesn't add up. I mean, they found they believe domestic dwellings now at Gebekli Tepe. Okay. They, they believe they found domestic dwellings now at Karahan Tepe as well around these main enclosures these main ceremonial enclosures but it doesn't mean people were living there it could be the fact that they were actually you know pilgrims coming in from different areas and uh you know working at different sites and moving around the landscape so there's lots of different ideas about this now um but they have found what they think are domestic dwellings but they're not really sure i mean we don't we don't really go with that because none of these sites are right next to rivers or anything so it's really hard to survive there they literally have to collect rainwater and harvest it and mm-hmm. use it you know when it rains uh, this huge kind of like system. It sounds that. a little like Chaco in some way, that in that sense, right? Like Chaco Canyon, that's what I think of right away where you're like, they collected rainwater, there was nothing to eat there. Yeah. There was like no way to feed people. There you couldn't support a you know, a population there. It had to be maybe you say as a pilgrimage, or perhaps maybe it was, you know, the builders. I know in in, in Egypt they've got these villages of people that had to live somewhere because they're building it, you know, for however many years. But well, it seems like yeah, it seems like Hugh that they knew something that we didn't in terms of how they chose their locations. Obviously, human beings just choose the you know beachfront property, or you know, <laughs> we 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 go to the location. But it seems like the ancients knew something that we didn't when when they chose a location to build something, even if it was in the middle of nowhere. There was a reason, right? Yeah, I, I think location is very important to these people. I think um, you know, Gebekli Tepe is a very interesting location because you're not too, you're only a few miles from uh, the Euphrates, uh, the river, but they've now found all these you know carved out of solid bedrock water collection stations. You know, this is this is definitely a thing. But you know, and they've also found lots of grinding tools and brewing kits for like beer which they were definitely brewing there and so they had they had a system in place so and it was very lush back then there was a lot of there was a quite a lot of rain at this time this was like the fertile crescent you know this is like the fertile area but there's still a big debate about about if people were directly living there or just visiting it you know from different areas and they would stay there for a few days do their do their ceremonies and things like this and then move on they would help out a bit they would help grind make some food for the their clans that were coming in to visit and things like this so you, you got these ideas that are, that are coming in about at these sites and that's one of the things that we're going to be i'm going to be writing about is that side of it mm-hmm. because they're really all the archaeologists are really pushing this domestic thing and they're trying to take away the sort of sacredness of the site you know they're trying to make out they're just li- even the enclosures people just lived in them as elaborate houses you know and things like this why do you think that they they're doing that well klaus schmidt it was the original archaeologist he was brilliant he, he discovered the site pretty much uh back in 94 95 uh, he died unfortunately a few years ago and uh but he was very much that these are temples these are definitely temples they have to be you know the way they're constructed the layout and everything else we don't know why this has all changed with the new archaeologists. It just has. I mean, they might be right. People might have ended up living there, you know, because they just loved it so much. But one of the things that proves their temples is the fact that they're beautifully acoustic. They have geometry, very sophisticated geometry, working with the cardinal directions, which equ- equates to being a temple. And also they have... Uh, 
accurate and very intricate measurement systems, the metrology as well, in, in encoded, embedded within these sites. And this, so they must have had an understanding of earth measurements as well. And so these kind of things put it down as a temple, a sacred place, you know, a uh, kind of, and you can see that when you're finding the same designs, abstract artistic designs of T pillars and other such things, uh, every other site in the area over a, a thousand, two thousand year period, you can see how influential this was. And that wouldn't have been just for domestic or practical reasons. And isn't the archaeoastronomy a good argument as well? The idea that these things are all so intricately solar and, and then celestial aligned. It's like, I know there's a bunch of weirdos now that, that'll they'll lay out their houses for certain reasons like that. And no offense if anyone here does that, but it, it seems an odd thing to do for your dwelling to be like, let's make sure that we capture all these celestial events. And and, and I believe it isn't, isn't Kaharan Tepe, isn't also like a solar, ca basically a solar calendar in, in, in the way that the pillars are lined up as well? Yeah, there's a, there's a theory put forward uh, by Martin Sweatman, who claims it's a loony solar calendar. So if you count if you count the different pillars in the head in a certain way, it equates to the number of uh, months, then into calorie days at the end of the year and things like this. He's decoded the same thing from Pillar 43 at Gebekli Tepe as well. And uh, it's a hypothesis he's put forward. He's actually an academic, so he's getting it peer-reviewed. And... If he's right, which he, he could well be, that this fits in with this winter solstice discovery as well. It fits in with the summer solstice alignments because you have to have a beginning point of any type of calendar. And the winter solstice traditionally, in many ancient cultures, was the kind of start of the new year. It wasn't January the 1st. It wasn't the equinox or anything like that. That's when it generally was. And so, yeah, I believe that's the case. And you also mentioned about the covering over of the sites here, yeah, just before we forget that, um, as you said, many of these sites, including Gebekli and Karahan Tepe, they've proven now, were deliberately kind of repaired, put back together, and then covered over. Now, Klaus Schmidt believed this was all done ritualistically. This was all done as part of a kind of process of closing down, decommissioning, uh, burying the site like you bury your relatives, and then moving on. You know, And so that's one aspect, but the new archaeologists are claiming it collapsed inwards and then they repaired it and buried it and things like this. So um, there's two mm. different schools of thought on that. But it's known that Karahan Tepe, for instance, the, the pillar shrine or the AB pit, that was definitely deliberately covered over and, it, and that preserved it until 2019. For 11, preserved it for over 11,000 years and everything was in place when they uncovered that. The main enclosure, enclosure AD, the 75 foot wide one at Karahan Tepe, it's been, it looks like it was deliberately damaged, like mm. things were broken deliberately and then it was covered over. But they placed all the, the stone plates on the benches, they put some statues in back in position then they covered it over and so what on earth was that all about so something might have happened they just had to move on that it run its course you know it'd been used for 1500 years and it was time for a change or they had to be forced out by incoming invaders the weather might have turned they were growing food now in different places a different you know thought, thought system about you know religion and things who knows but they definitely did deliberately cover them up is there any relation this might be a dumb question between the 12 sites they've discovered and maybe the pillars themselves because there's 11 freestanding pillars and then there's that one or 11 uh, ones that are carved out you said that it looked like uh, mushrooms or phalluses or whatever and then you have that one freestanding one is that is that connected to the, the sites themselves because sometimes on a show we you know they build these things but they're they're strategic with other places and even though they're far they're far from each other yeah, well, there are there are definite route ways between each of these sites. Uh, we're currently doing some research on the ge geodetic nature, see if there's connections between them. And we are finding it starting to find patterns, um, kind of in the landscape, almost like almost like we found a ley line connecting some of them up. You know, like a, a series of sites in a dead straight line, for instance. We found like two of those, I think, in that whole area. We found connections with sites worldwide as well, geodetically and measurement wise. You know, mm. over thousands of miles in some cases suggesting this may have been known about in very early times and actually the builders when they closed it down 
moved on and spread this knowledge outwards because the geometries that I've now found inside it are exactly the same as as the ones you find in British stone circles, uh, which is unbelievable. It, it just doesn't make any sense. And and so when you start applying all this to the Book of Enoch and the Sumerian traditions and the Old Testament, some of the stories will start to make sense that this knowledge was being shared from this area and around the world. Mm. That's wild. I just feel like the, the more that we find out, Hugh, uh, uh, and the more that we discover, the, the, le- the less we know. It, it almost feels that way. And, and the fact that there's a pit full of phalluses, it, I just want to make 10, 10 different <laughs> jokes. I know we're having a serious conversation, but <laughs> it's like, you know, they didn't cover it up because it wasn't funny anymore. Because here we are, you know, 10,000 years later, it's still funny. So uh, do, you, do you believe this is, this, is, this is the epicenter for a lot of the geometry that we're talking about spreading out? Do yeah. you think it came from somewhere else? Do you think there's a, there's, a predecessor to this because i know that when we you know going back to graham hancock's thing because i think everyone has a point of reference they're finding you know he he talked about structures and i believe in indonesia that are even super older and you know we there hasn't been excavations there but we know there are older structures and you talked about some of the ones ice age ones that, that exist i think that knowledge was passed passed down from older older structures is this, is this ground zero is that what you're saying or is this yeah is this ground zero or do you believe that this was something that was imparted perhaps is like in the Anakian tradition um that you had mentioned before where this is this is an impartation of knowledge maybe this is this is ground zero for that i personally think that Gebekli tepe and karahan tepe the this is ground zero when it comes to innovation you know uh, that became civilization soon after i call it a super civilization because the advancements of and and sudden change that took place in this era are just astonishing. You know, you have sophisticated astronomy. Um, we're not just talking about the sun and the moon. We're talking about the stars. The Gebekli and Karahan have connections with Cygnus, uh, Deneb, you know, in Cygnus. You have the Sirius thing. Was, Sirius was starting to rise on the southern horizon and things like this. That was being recorded. New evidence we've got with Scorpius. I was talking with Andrew about today, in fact, which uh, is going to come out in the in the books. And so there's lots and lot. It's, it's too advanced, all this kind of stuff. And then you look into the geometry. This is something I haven't published yet. I'm going to do an article about this. It's going to be coming out in my book as well. And I've talked about it in a couple of my lectures. But this is basically... So the geometry is the most fascinating part for me because we've got... If you look into the work of Alexander Tom in the 1950s and 60s, we find that he came up with eight or nine different types of geometry, specific orient, it's different sort of elliptical egg shapes, flattened circles, things like this. And the same principles and the same geometries have now been found at Gebekli Tepe and Karahan Tepe. I just looked into this myself and found all these. I'm amazed no one else had done it before. And so that blew my mind. And then I worked with a gentleman called Adam Tetlow, who's a master geometer and metrologist, uh, ancient measurement expert. And he found that the same measurement systems that we find at places like Stonehenge and in the pyramids, Sumerian uh, ziggurats were used at Gebekli Tepe. Wow. So it must have come from there. It mm-hmm. must have originated there. They were using it first. Now, we haven't found them at any other sites as yet because not enough has been excavated. So there might be more, there might be older, but this is what we've found so far. And so if that's the case, then this is this is a massive, massive story. And the archaeologists, the academics, they're not really that interested in geometry or astronomy or ancient measurement systems. They're just not interested, whereas I am, and many of my colleagues and friends are. So we, we're going to be doing this ourselves and applying what we know uh, to these sites. And we have to thank people like Alexander Tom, also John Neal and John Michelle, who are like my mentors, who've been looking at looking into these side of things, ancient sites, for a very long time. Mm. You know, it reminds me, Hugh, a lot. Early on on our show, we, we interviewed Fritz Zimmerman, and he wrote a book about – he does a lot of the mathematical work here in, in – in America and all these mounds and and he was saying that the natives wouldn't have had access to this sacred geometry, right? And they were building things to the solstice here. They have the serpent mound. So you have this you have this math, you know, this sort of ancient math here in America, and you have these serpent mounds here too. So they must have spread out from somewhere. They should, they 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 were all over kind of building the same things. And have you seen any connection here in America to the things you're finding over there in Turkey? Well, yeah, you do. I mean, a, a lot of people underestimate the Native Americans and their the, the quality of the 
the layout of some of their mound sites. Or at least they learned it from somebody, you know? Yeah, but but it's, it's so advanced, the geometry they were using. They were using Pythagorean triangles. They were using alignments like exactly like we find, you know, in Giza, you know, around Egypt, in Britain and other such places. They, the similar geometries to some of the stone circles as well. And so whether they, they – it's, it's likely – they might have come up with them. They could have come up with them independently because a smart, rational mind. And remember, if these are the giants we're talking about, they had big brains to work with as well. And they were probably, again, they were eating bags of mushrooms in North America as well <laughs> and getting stimulated and getting, having ideas flowing and things like this. They got ideas, good, man. Good, uh-huh. Well, there's a good case. There's two ways to look at this. Either there's a migration eventually made its way over to America. This is Fritz Zimmerman's, one of his theories. It all began in the Bible lands, spread out through Europe, it came over the Atlantic to America. That's where you get the Nephilim in America, things like this. There's also the the kind of beyond that, you have the Denisovan DNA and um, ideas coming down from Siberia, which which migrated into Turkey and America many hundreds of thousands of years ago. And some of those ideas maintained themselves. So there's different ways of looking at it. But I think there are connections between the Americas and you know the middle east there's lots of there's lots of strange things that have been found in peru for instance or bolivia you have the fuente magna bowl found near lake titicaca near tiwanaku they had two different types of sumerian inscriptions with a mara script which is a local bolivian um ancient kind of text so and that must be like 2000 bc or something like this and so what's that doing there and was there a connection with sumeria in 2000 bc so why not from other times because we know there's now people taken to boats and sailing around the world going back 40 to fifty thousand years or more you know i think there's even a thing that came out something like four hundred thousand years ago they found evidence of sailing and things like this and so why not why can't ideas be spread around why can't there be kind of movement around the planet when you look at the book of enoch you actually get passages in that that talk about Enoch being taken by the angel Uriel and flown around to different places, to these different latitudes, to these different areas that have got different weather, different terrain and uh, um, things like this. And this is clearly stated and written down. And he's, he's, he, he was a scribe, Enoch. He was known as a scribe. So he was trying to write down all this stuff that he was learning, all these places he was being taken to. And he and he's, he's literally spoke about going off to measure and build and looking through porthole stones at the sun and the stars so all the stuff we're talking about was written down and recorded by people like this and in these ancient books and so no doubt to me there was certainly movement around the planet and ideas spreading out from places like gebekli tepe Mm. the mathematics though right like we're talking high knowledge we're talking like advanced mathematics which is always is the is like the smoking gun as far as i'm concerned that we we what we're being told isn't is about history isn't true like because at this point I mean, it's the same story with the megaliths. You, it's like you go to Peru and you see the Incan uh, architecture and structures, and, and it doesn't look like the megaliths. It's it's different. They use mortar and brick, and and we have precision fit stones. This is just Peru, for example. Same thing, and same thing across the globe. It, it's fascinating to me that it was known across across the planet. It was known in these all these different places, and then is lost. And I mean, I, I know we have the flood epic and the flood story, the, the Noa- Noahic flood, and that could account for some, for maybe potentially the, lo- the loss of knowledge. But I, I just, I love the work you're doing because I, I think it's so important to realize that, like, even when we talk about the new archaeologists, like they're, they're still pushing the narrative that isn't backed up by the, the historical, the the evidence, the record, the stones, the the things you you can touch and touch and put your hands on, and then measure. That's what I think is so impo- really important about the work you're doing. And I'm works, I'm excited for one that. You're talking about this on our show because you get you know your book's coming out and you've you've lectured a bit about this, but but grateful for you sharing that because it, it is a mind grenade that there is that we're finding the same geometry at a place that is way older than we're than we're supposed to find it, and then that's replicated in in places like France and, and in in the UK in in the Britons, and then you know Fritz has found similar things. We we've talked we've done a, an episode on the Serpent Mound. And and talking about its celestial alignment and the geometry there, and you're like, these things all are the same, and they're all really old. I think I, I can't reiterate how important it is that that this gets rewritten. It it, it matters. It, it, it's just funny to me that this is 
that it's outside the box to think that, that these things existed when they did. And I'm just, it's just impressed upon me that that's just as, it's crazy that people push back against that. You know, they lived there. It was a, it was a house, you know, it was a house with all these, you know, with, with nowhere to, <laughs> nowhere to live, just a lot of T-pillars. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. I mean, I think uh, what Graham Hancock's done with Ancient Apocalypse is, uh, is, is, is brilliant, actually. I mean, I, I'm just delighted. It, it's, it's got the exposure it has, like tens of millions of viewers, you know, seeing, you know, Carahan Tepe was on there as well. He went there yeah. actually, like, when it just started to be excavated only half of the main enclosure was actually kind of uncovered and uh he was fortunate enough to get inside the the pillar shrine you know, which we're not definitely not allowed to do that anymore that's for sure but yes yeah, so you know i think like you need people like that to break down the kind of boundaries i mean he's been doing this for 20 or 30 years mind mm-hmm. you but it all makes to me a lot of it makes sense of what he, what he talks about i don't necessarily agree with everything he says right but right fundamentally he's on the you know he's he's the pioneer he's the one who's getting attacked he's the one who's putting his reputation on the line and pushing the boundaries down and and just you know going into debate with archaeologists about this who are you know quite mean to him <laughs> in some yeah. cases pretty, pretty nasty he gets pretty nasty but if they're reacting that badly to this kind of stuff why are they doing that you know, there must be something in there that is really annoying them, you know, that he's got an element of truth in it. There must be, because otherwise, why would they bother? Why don't they just dismiss it as a load of nonsense? Right. You know, they, mm-hmm. they're actually, you know, you know what I mean? So there's like, yeah, you're, you're over the target. You're over the target. If you get the, so you're getting the pushback. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the things we did. Yeah. That's one of the things I, I tend to focus on with the, the conference and, uh, that I organize uh, in, here in every May. We, we, we bridge the balance between academic and alternative uh, researchers and actually throw them all into the mix on the same stage. And we, we, we now get top, you know, uh, academic archaeologists and historians and things like this alongside some quite far out ideas, far out, you know, speakers and things like that. And, and this is what we've been doing for years and and so is graham and so i think it's just you'll keep doing it and now where they're all getting on with each other and becoming friends and realizing oh there's something in that you know oh yeah and people are now the alternative people are now respecting the archaeologists because they're willing to kind of open their minds a bit and likewise the people who've been into the far out stuff are realizing what archaeologists do is very important they do all the hard work you know digging and mm-hmm. exploring you know and kind of getting into right. you know but i think there's when it comes to interpretation that's open for to everybody i think i think you've got to have right. different disciplines interpreting the sites rather than just just archaeologists doing it yeah i mean because i think you know you can get sort of pigeonhole i mean every expert has their blind spots right every person every researcher has a blind spot it's it's impossible and i think that you know the way the academics and science used to work is you throw it all in the pot everyone every let's get some hypothesis is you know let's let's figure this out and then i don't know in the last 50 years it seems like there's one narrative if you challenge it you're out and it's it's a strange time to be a human being especially with research and one thing we we talk a lot about on our show, Hugh, is there's familiar themes. Obviously, Luke and I, you know, we're not. This isn't really our expertise. We don't dive into these rabbit holes all the time. We're more in the creature space. But there seems to be this emphasis on bloodlines, reproduction, and fertility that goes on in the the ancient world. And sometimes I think about it like a modern day human. Like they had the same problems that we had, right? They they were trying to get energy. And some people are just like, oh, this this pyramid is a giant tomb. And it doesn't make any sense. What what makes more sense is some sort of power source, some sort of generator. Because that's what they needed like we need today. We need we got our electrical grid. They have their electrical grid. They don't look anything the same, but the similar problem, right? So is maybe some place like Kaharan Tepe, maybe an ancient fertility site. You go there, you get pregnant. You go there, you're you see all these big giant phalluses, and then you get you got a baby. I don't know. That's the way my mind thinks. Like, is that could it be something so simple? And it is. A, is it is a shrine, but it's 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 just, there's a functional purpose. It's like a medical center, maybe. Yeah, I, I totally. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, that's what me and JJ are currently writing about. The idea it's a fertility site. That's one of our main themes, because we've got a second article coming out on the GrahamHancock.com website um, in the next few weeks we're taking our time with it it's also going to be a chapter in a forthcoming book and this is it this is what we're finding because those those kind of phallus shaped stones you know those three monoliths 
are like Shiva lingams of ancient Vedic tradition, you know, uh, which are often associated with fertility and and uh, abundance and things like this. And the same principles are there. And JJ has found lots and lots of evidence of goddess traditions there. The, even the place names as well are linked with, uh, you know, this goddess, this feminine aspect, you know. And so, yeah, the list goes on. And we, we've done a whole, a, a whole load of research on that because – even the winter solstice sun is like a, a male shard of light penetrating the female porthole stone and then going into this womb-like chamber, um, which has got phalluses in it, and then water comes in, which is feminine. So there's all this constant mix. So mm. it could be what you say. It could be a birthing site. It could be a place where people go and get pregnant or give birth. There were certainly, we believe, ceremonies and rituals and dances and celebrations on the winter solstice where this kind of stuff would have happened. In pagan traditions, that's on May Day where all the locals get together and, and get busy and go crazy with each other over a few days and get pregnant and everything else. But the winter solstice is also fertilizing time of year as well. And like you start looking into the traditions, you start looking into what even archaeologists like Aubrey Burl have been writing about. They say the same thing. This is highly likely what these were used for. It's not just to record astronomy or not just for ceremony. There's specific reasons behind that. And I think what you're saying works very well at Karahan Tepe possibly Gebekli Tepe but I see Gebekli Tepe more as a centre of innovation almost like a university a teaching area where, where all the ideas would be in place whereas Karahan was more of a kind of ceremonial shamanic site yeah, I love it. I, I mean, that's the way my that's mind wild. works. That's the way I think about things. I mean, because some of the creatures we hear about on our show, you, they have genetic anomalies, right? They have six fingers, six toes, double rows of teeth, giant heads, physical sort of hybrid maybe problems, right? They're, some of them say are described as different colored. Their, their blood doesn't work. So do you think that these beasts could have creatures, giants, whatever, could have had like problems getting pregnant? They couldn't they couldn't reproduce oh. as easy this took a turn it could, it could be <laughs> the case it could be the case i mean like for funnily enough one of the statues at carahan tepe on the hands of eight fingers on each hand some of the other statues have four fingers six fingers and things like this even the archaeologist neshmi Kural stated quite clearly he's confused why there's no statues with normal amount of fingers or, or carved on them mm -hmm. and what does that mean and so yeah so it, it, i mean there's also uh stat lots of statues of animals and humans with like emaciation with like almost like they're starving they're showing their ribs and things like this they're really skinny and so was there a problem with growing food is this why they had to create this kind of fertility and there's also traditions you know this is very strong traditions everywhere around the world that you know you know having you know, literally having fertility rites at ancient sites would stimulate fertility, not just in themselves, but in the animals, the plants and the landscape. And so sexual rights was part of this. And I, I believe the symbolism kind of proves that at, at Karahan Tepe, this was most likely the case. It's mm. interesting. But you've also got the, uh, the animal, right? Because a lot of the, um, you mentioned the animals. Yeah. So you've got a lot of the statues there. Uh, kind of half human with a kind of almost like um, a kind of animal on their back, you know, like, um, you know, different creatures like foxes, um, uh, different canids as well. You know, they, some of the statues literally have them standing on their back, holding their head and things like this. And so, you know, there's even if you look back into the old traditions again, which I've been doing a lot recently, like there's, there's all these kind of symbols of, like bestiality bestiality which is sounds pretty dark you know crosses your mind what, what that means but it may be more symbolic more of a shamanic kind of combination of human animal hybrid rather than a sounds like a skinwalker sounds like a skinwalker yeah exactly so there's this kind of well. shamanic element as well i think you know when you're looking into these sites because that they really revered animals you know they they, they they domesticated many of them they feared them no doubt they ate a lot of them i'm sure but there's also this kind of hybrid element which i think was ceremonial and linked with fertility and it was a way to kind of enhance fertility in themselves and the landscape. So there's, there's, there's all these things to consider. There's something me and JJ are currently writing about as we speak. Mm. So I think it's, you know, everyone's wondering, wants to know if you uh, ever dig up a statue of Bigfoot out there, you gotta, you gotta let us know. <laughs> 
that 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 is the to know. that that is the source of Bigfoot, Luke. He came yeah. out of the ground of Kaharan Tepe, yeah. the, and then he spread all over the world. <laughs> Uh, I mean, we talk about you know we talk about mythological creatures in the show, and you have like the centaurs and the and the and the the goat man and and all these these sort of hybridized, you know. And if you look at Genesis six four, and that all flesh is corrupted, there there could be something something to that in the sense of, you know, I, if if we're to, you know, say perhaps some of these things were actual real creatures, and it was a, it, you know, this this weird this weird creation and hybridizing of human and, and animal DNA. Could be that. It could be symbolic. I mean, it, I think it's fascinating that that's as old as it is. That's that's what's on the walls, right? That's what that's what they choose to memorialize for. You know, for as long as the stone will stand, that's been memorialized. It's it's interesting. The, Sum- the Sumerian myths, which this kind of general area, uh, although thousands of years later, may have been influenced by this 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 time. They talk about. I mean, you look into the Sumerian translations. You look into the stories of Enlil, Enki, Ninhar, Sag, and so forth, and they talk about creating. Uh, a different race of humans to be kind of subservient to them out of clay and blood, i.e. DNA and things like this, and also combinations of animals to be their kind of slave animals, if you like. And this is this is the genuine Sumerian translations. This isn't Zachariah Sitchin. This isn't kind of outrageous kind of ideas that have been put forward along this is what they lines. wrote down this is they actually wrote this is in cuneiform yeah this, this is written down and, and and we know they must have been talking about this time this camera and tepe gebekli tepe time because they talk about very clearly the beginning of agriculture how it went from almost like a hunter gatherer to agriculture and it, that we know when that mm-hmm. happened now which is about nine thousand. you can date that yeah. yeah and so they must yeah. have so they must have been talking around this time this is where all these advanced kind of semi-divine beings emerged in the area and built these sites built these constructions oh. developed all these different civilizing ideas and then developed agriculture domesticated them these were written about in the sumerian stories and no one really knew when that was from they thought it was maybe four thousand bc or something but no it could be like nine nine to ten thousand bc That's um wild. so it's, it's odd. I mean, you yeah. start looking into these old myths and stories, and they're very strange, and they're very kind of matter of fact. Some of them as well, right? And they run parallel. I mean, that that runs parallel to a lot of what you know what you see from other traditions as well, and the biblical narrative, and and it's man, it's it's crazy. I, that's why I love what you're doing, Hugh. Is that we're you're just you're you're digging. You're literally out there digging and, and rewriting rewriting history as we know it and as been told to us or spoon fed to us and and it's it's funny how how you you be able to sift the truth right that's what i think i get out of most of this is that like like nate said you put everything in the pot but i really the truth is what comes out you know if you have if you're really looking for it and not and not to back up your your predetermined hypothesis or or not to back up what your donors have paid you to find right if you're really just looking for the truth you you can't keep it under wraps forever it doesn't doesn't stay hidden and i think we're seeing some of that what's going on yeah I got one last question for you, and I know you probably got to go. Thanks for your time, by the way, Hugh. Nowadays, we have drones and we have planes. We can go up in the air and we can look down. Is there anything in that area we can look down on that's different or are there any UFO connection or any weird stuff that seems to suggest that not only were they building it, you know, you know, on the ground, but you could, when you zoom out, you could see some weird stuff? Yeah, I mean, there's the, there's a few of like, um, there are a few anomalies in the landscape. There's something Andrew Collins has, has been noting around some of the sites. There's almost like kind of like geoglyph symbolism. Like they've chosen certain places because of when you look at it from afar or above, it looks like a kind of crescent moon or something like this. You know, it's this, but when you start going under the ground, I mean, look at sites like Derinkuyu, a few hundred miles to the west, huge underground cities. They found some near the Gebekli Tepe region in a place called Mardin now. So you get an underground cities you know huge amount of work carving these out they date back to a possibly a similar era so i think you know we're, we're trying to kind of look at it as well i mean once once the sites become excavated you realize like there's a site called Ayan Lahoyak, for instance, that hasn't even been excavated yet, but it's huge. It's bigger than the whole of Gebekli Tepe. Even Gebekli Tepe, only 5% has been uncovered. Mm. Um, whereas Karahan Tepe, they estimate 1% has been uncovered, you know, and things like this. And so the pos- possibilities of what we're going to see, I think we'll start to see more of what you're talking about, possible kind of landscape kind of shaping going on. Um, 
possibly different geometries or even figures in the landscape mm. um you know like geoglyphs like you know you find in nazca and things like that who knows i mean there's some found in saudi arabia which is causing a bit of a sensation at the moment and a few other places in the middle east so yeah so who knows what what's gonna uh. gonna come out i mean it's still in the kind of excavation process and it'll be going on for many more years in fact Mm. Well, I got. Well, I got one. I got one last. Student. Oh, there you go. You, 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 you've written. You've written on giants. We talked about giants in Britain uh, on the show. You're a giant guy. Anything fresh on that front for us? Or uh, you could. You can. You might not. But um, I always like to check in on on any recent discovery <laughs> revelations around around the big guys. Well, yeah. I mean, uh, we've. I, I kind of put that to bed while I focus on this, but right. we, that we are finding more and more accounts. I mean. North America, more and more keep coming up, which is kind of kind of freaky. We're hoping mm -hmm. to find more in Turkey and places like this. We know there are quite a few from the Middle East, which are kind of on our minds, but we haven't found any direct connections yet with sites we're looking at like Karahan Tepe and so forth. In fact, one interesting thing, Ayan Lahoyak, which is one of is, that's going to be in the news in about three or four years. That's going to be the big site everyone's talking about, like Karahan Tepe is today. That the name of that translates in Kurdish because we know it was all Kurdish, this kind of area potentially as to like some kind of giant being eating or, or devouring. And so even the, one of the names of the sites now we have related to giants, which is like, that sort of shocked us when we spoke to the locals and got this information. This is this is why it's we, one of the things me and Andrew and JJ do a lot. We, we've got friends over in Turkey, and they come with us, and um, they translate for us, and we get to meet the locals, the town elders, uh, and get all the all the information about what was really going on and the names, you know, everything else. Yeah. So we've been gathering data like that. There's like this site as well, Ian Lahoyak. They found this giant cave system which goes hundreds of meters in to the earth but they blocked it all up but we've got the guys said they'll go in and photograph it all for us and send it back to us and they say there's carvings down there there's bones in some of them so yeah who knows what's good what's going to come out of there awesome. but directly relating to the giants yeah we found we found a few more from britain since the book just a couple more um we've we found since we published up giants on record book about north america back in 2015 there's something like 400 more accounts have been on wow. <laughs> as more papers or newspapers get digitized and so it's not us mm. doing the research we've got a couple of people uh this guy giants of ancient america who does instagram yeah, travis yeah travis roy we know Tra he's been yeah. on the show oh yeah, yeah. oh yeah a couple of yeah. others so i keep an eye on what they're up to and i'm like wow okay there's, there's more and more coming out here so so the data is building up i mean it, it's just yeah, you know this this is the problem this is the problem so you, you can't keep dismissing it if you get more and more accounts like this you know right. and i think that what we uncovered in britain i think surprised a lot of people uh, mm. because people didn't expect it here they thought we thought we were going to find 20 accounts if we're lucky but we ended up with 250. Mm. so even a small island to britain um an island um uh, we were quite impressed with what we found i love it here giant island baby yeah, that's right. <laughs> there's a, there's a spider web, and it seems to go all over the, the the world, you know. And it starts maybe in some of these places like Karen Tepe. So we appreciate you, you coming on, dropping your uh, knowledge on our listeners, and uh, maybe share with them how they can get involved with uh, with where you're at and what you're doing, whatever you want to plug. Sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, they, they can they can search for me all all sorts of social media. Our, our megalithomania website is just megalithomania.co.uk. Also, the big YouTube channel. We've got like a thousand videos up on. You've got tons on Carrie and Tepe now. Um, we've got new, new, uh, new, new videos coming out soon uh, to sort of coincide with the Ancient Aliens episode that we're involved with. Obviously, we do uh, our big. You know, we, we encourage people to get out and explore and meet meet us all. We we do our big megalithomania conference every May sixth and seventh of May in Glastonbury, England. We do four days of tours. We have all, all this kind of ancient mysteries information, including academics as well. We've got a great lineup this year. People can check it out on the website. We also we also take groups out now with Andrew and JJ to Karahantepe and Turkey. We do a couple of tours a year, and this this really helps us 
because we're we're completely self-funded so it helps you know enable our research and also we we discover things on on our trips as well with groups and so it blows their mind you know when we kind of make these little discussions sometimes they point stuff out we haven't even seen didn't even notice before mm-hmm. we found this in 2015 we found this bone plaque that a friend of ours was on the tour had eye surgery laser surgery like a few days a few weeks before and we can see it but he saw it and there was this inscription it's a tiny little thing three inches tall this bone fragment carved t-pillars on it which is the first pictorial image of t-pillars anywhere found in the area uh-huh. and it caused this viral sensation and it was one of our tour members who, who kind of found it so we do we do enjoy it when groups come out because we're we're researching while we travel we stay on and and continue our research afterwards so people want to check out our tours they're happening in may september to turkey but we do other ones to multiple other places as well um yeah it really helps us and you know we have a lot of fun as well so yeah it's all on megalithomania.co.uk appreciate it yeah Yeah, everyone get out there nate we gotta get out there and see that stuff i know you we're gonna come we're gonna come annoy you you know, two, Sounds two good. Big, no, no, big no, no, dumb no, Americans, fall, big yeah. dumb Americans, the beards following you around, yeah, pointing at stuff in the dirt. Yeah, <laughs> it takes it takes a lot of people sometimes. It's amazing what you can find if you just get a group of people in an area and what everyone points out. Everyone's seeing something different. It's amazing how many things yeah, can just true. be right there in the dirt. And you can't. You just walk over it a thousand times, and it takes some mind and some particular day to figure it out. So. No, I agree and I, th- I think it's, there's a lot to be said for that and so you know you know this this is why we enjoy getting together at the conferences and on the tours because mm. you get people just like us you know just want to they're fascinated they want to find out more they want different ideas and they mm. can search for themselves and especially somewhere like this part of Turkey where it's still being excavated you know mm-hmm. things are actually happening now it's, it's almost like going back to the you know 1800s in Egypt when they're starting to uncover the temples yeah. or the jungles of Mexico and things like that when they're starting to make the discoveries this is what it's, it's like now in Turkey so it's it's quite a fascinating time to be getting out to these places that's so cool yeah, yeah. it's like yeah it's like you're on the front end instead of the back end I mean, I'll bring my mom. She can find anything. I'll bring her as well. All right. So <laughs> that's right. You, uh, you. Thanks again, man. We, t- yeah, we totally you. appreciate your time and and uh, and spending time with us. And uh, yeah, everybody, check out what he's doing. Check out the tours. Uh, and and then yeah, you've got another. I know you have another article dropping on Graham Hancock's uh, website that's coming up. More on, as you say, I want to say it like I'm British. Carahan. Is that right? Carahan. Yeah. Tepe. Yeah. I get, I'm working on it. Yeah. <laughs> thanks. That's you. proper. That's yeah. the proper way. Yeah. No, well, th- well, thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Thanks yeah. for inviting me on the show. And uh, yeah, take care. All right. Good to see you, brother. Yeah, see thank you. you.